Okay, welcome to another STAT 510 video. Um, in this video, we're gonna talk about expectation. That's what we're gonna talk about for the whole video. Might be a long video. I might try to do uh, all of this in one video. We'll see how it goes. Uh, basically, we're gonna go till my hand cramps or I run out of water and my uh, throat gets too dry. Um, and I'll try to throw some annotations in the uh, description of the video so you can seek around. Uh, and that way you don't have to go to uh, too many different videos. Um, apologies for my hair. You know, it's a quarantine. It is what it is. Okay. So, um, right. Uh, hopefully a lot of what we see here again is still a review. We're sort of still in the, um, portion of the class where we're talking about probability before we move on to statistics. We'll see sort of our first little hint of statistics today, but it'll just kind of, it'll be very subtle and passing and we'll sort of blow right by it. Um, but maybe I'll catch on to a few new things today. Uh, maybe you'll develop a few new intuitions. So hopefully you grab something out of here, but if not, hopefully this is a good review. It'll jog your memory and it'll be helpful uh, when you go to start thinking about the homework. All right, I'm gonna get rid of my face. Uh, maybe I'll pop in a few times just to say hi um, to uh, cut up the monotony of looking at my awful handwriting. Uh, but for now, I'll see you later. Okay, so most of what we're gonna do in, in this chapter is define a bunch of things. Um, so after I get through two definitions, I could kind of just stop this video uh, and I'll, more on that when we get there, but we gotta start with the most basic definition, which is the expected value of some random variable and we'll just use X as a placeholder uh, for some particular random variable. Um, this is also called the mean that's terrible handwriting. We'll also see that this is the first moment. So when I say the mean, I'm uh, specifically talking about the mean of a random variable. Um, I emphasize this because surely somewhere you've also seen the notion of a sample mean, uh, a uh, or you know, even a sample mean calculated on a particular data set. Um, those are data ideas. Um, we're specifically talking about a probability idea right now, which is that uh, a random variable X can have a mean. Uh, and that mean is defined like so. Um, for now, I'm gonna skip from here to here um, to say that there's sort of two different definitions depending upon whether or not the random variable X is discrete or the random variable X is continuous. Um, if it's a discrete case, well then the expectation uh, that is the mean is a function of the probability mass function. And if it is a continuous distribution, well then it's a function of the probability density function. Um, so, uh, there's a sort of um, integral that I skipped over, uh, and I'm going to skip over it for a moment more. Uh, sorry, I just got to rearrange my desk for a second. Okay, so um, the definition is uh, on the left-hand side, we have this uh, weird-looking E thing, and that's going to be our notation that tells us, well, we're talking about the expected value of a random variable X. And then the thing on the right-hand side is um, the definition. But I want to note that there are a bunch of different ways we will notate this quantity, um, mostly due to the convenience of whatever situation we're in. Uh, here are some of those. So we got our sort of blackboard uh, chalkboard E thing uh, with brackets around an X. That's sort of like the, the most basic. Uh, we could also drop the brackets. I probably won't do this very often. I'm not a, a fan of that notation, but you'll see it. Um, we could also do this weird integral thing. Um, so I'm gonna say, if this doesn't mean anything to you, that's fine. Um, somewhere in a real analysis class or a measure theory class, you might get into why this can substitute for both the discrete and the continuous case. But for our purposes, we're not going to dive into that. But we are going to say, well, this is a notation that means if discrete, use this expression. If continuous, use this other expression. Um, 
You'll also often see uh, mu sub x to mean the mean of a random variable x. So oftentimes this Greek character mu is used to mean the mean. Um, and sometimes if we're being lazy, which will be a bit of a theme uh, in this video, uh, we just drop the x and say, well, from context, you know that we're talking about the random variable x. So we're not going to write it because we're lazy. Okay. So that is the definition of uh, the expected value of a random variable x. Let's now develop some intuition around this. So here I have a very basic example. So on the left here, I have um, a random variable for which it can take three possible values, 0, 1, and 2. Uh, and uh, in the right column of this table, we have the uh, probabilities for these things. Because again, this is a discrete random variable. It only takes three possible values. So that must be the probability mass function. So those are probabilities. Um, th this might look really familiar because what this is is, well, uh, we could have ran an experiment where we flipped a coin twice and counted how many heads we got. And these are the possibilities and their associated probabilities. Okay, great. So I want to calculate the expected value. So I go to the definition, which we see here. Uh, and then I simply uh, evaluate it. Uh, and then so lastly, we get zero times its probability plus one times its probability plus two times its probability. And that comes out to one. Um, so oftentimes we think of the mean as sort of a measure of the center of the distribution. It's not the only possible way to do that, but it is one way. And that sort of makes sense uh, if we, we think about what we have going on here. Not only is it the middle of the three values, but the way the probabilities fall is what matters here. So one is sort of a, a central thing here. Okay, cool. How about another example? So here is a quick example of doing the continuous case. Um, so I start with uh, just applying the definition. And, and something I did here was I wrote negative infinity to infinity. Uh, but then when I applied to the particular case here, I went from negative two to five because anywhere else, um, the PDF of this uniform random variable would be zero. So we don't have to worry about it. Um, and then some calculus uh, uh, magic happened. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the details of that. And the answer here is 1.5. Um, which again shouldn't be surprising given the way a uniform distribution works. That's you know the midpoint between negative two and five. Uh, but the thing I wanted to highlight here is that this is not one. Uh, and you might be thinking like, wh why do we care about that? Also, why was there a gap there? Um, why do we care that it's not one? Can expected values not be one? Well, no, they certainly can be. Um, but I'd like you to get into the habit of if you calculate an expected value to be one, to sort of step back and say, is it really? Or did you forget to put an X right there? Because if you forgot that X, well, then you're integrating a density and it had better integrate to one. So um, just something to uh, keep in mind, uh, a nice heads up there. Very common mistake. Okay, how about a more interesting example? So uh, I'm gonna flip a coin, uh, wait, Wait, uh, sorry. Hello. Uh, I'm going to flip a coin. I have a, a nice uh, silver dollar here. Um, yeah, so I'm going to flip this coin. And if it's heads, you get $100. If it's tails, you pay me $5. Uh, the question is, would you accept this bet? I'm going to get rid of myself again. So generally, one way to sort of think about expected value is a bet is fair if the expected value is zero. So fair bet if the expected value of X is zero. So a gambler would call this a, a, a an EV of zero. What a gambler is really looking for is a bet with a positive EV. But so this isn't saying that like, oh, you're going to get $0 from this bet. Uh, it's that you're going to get $0 from this bet on average. So that's at least fair. There's still uncertainty and someone's going to win or lose, but at least in the long run, it's sort of fair. So 
quickly here, uh, I'll just draw up a probability mass function here. So you lose $5 with probability one half, and you gain $100 with probability one half. Okay, so let's calculate that expected value now. All right, so by definition, that's the sum of x times f of x of all x. If my, if my pen is dying during this, I'm gonna be upset, okay? Anyway, I continue on, I plug in some values, so negative five times its probability plus 100 times its probability, and you end up with 47.5. So maybe you're thinking to yourself, hey, this is a great idea. I should, I should take this bet. Um, I disagree. I think you would be crazy to take this bet. Um, so I was really careful to only show you one side of this coin. Uh, you, you couldn't see it anyway, I don't think, because it's really old and roughed up, but I only showed you the tails. If I offer you this scenario, I think you should be very skeptical and you should say, huh, he probably is trying to pull a fast one on me and maybe it has two tails on it. I don't actually have a two-tailed coin sitting around because I'm not a dishonest gambler, but th that should really, th when you see a bet like this, you should say, someone is trying to take advantage of me. I shouldn't just take a bet. So if, if you inspect the coin and you're like, okay, it has a heads and a tails, then you should probably take the bet. Although it could be a loaded coin where it more likely comes up on one side or another. So you got to look out for that. Although I think physically that's kind of hard to do. I should find a reference on that. There's an interesting uh, a physicality to sort of the nature of flipping coins, but I'm not a physicist, so I don't want to make any claims there. But so let's, let's sort of redo this now with the possibility that instead of one half, one half for the two outcomes, it's any two arbitrary probabilities. So uh, this here uh, assumes a quote unquote fair, oh boy. This assumes a fair coin. And again, this was uh, tails, uh, this was heads. This is a nice example of a random variable where the function maps from tails to negative five and h to 100, you know, uh, think about last week. So now we're gonna say, well, the probability of heads is actually some arbitrary number p between zero and one. Um, uh, and the other probability must be one minus P. So now the expected value is actually uh, negative five times its probability plus 100 times its probability, uh, which if I do the algebra correctly, I believe is uh, five times 21 P minus one. Um, so if I set that equal to zero, um, that implies that this would be a fair bet. Oh gosh, I can't write the word fair. Uh, fair bet if P is equal to one over 21. Okay, so uh, to go back and answer the original question, no. I do not think you should take that bet. I do not think you should trust me. Um, you should be very skeptical of that. Okay, cool. Uh, how about another one of these where we sort of uh, consider a probability example uh, related to gambling. Probability developed from gambling, so you got it's, it, I'm contractually obligated to do a bunch of gambling examples. Okay, so this time, no funny business. We're gonna flip a fair coin. Uh, assuming this was minted correctly, it's going to be roughly fair. Okay, cool. Um, and I'm going to keep flipping it until it comes up tails. And uh, as a result of this game, should you choose to play it, uh, you will win two to the K dollars where K is the number of heads. So, you know, like if you get one heads and the game ends, you get $2. Um, if you get two heads and the game ends on the next one with the tails, uh, $4, then $8, 
and so on and so forth. So the question I ask now, and I'm just asking the heir in this room, is how much would you pay to play this game? So as I've defined the game, you can only win money. But so given that, how much would you pay me to actually enter into this arrangement uh, and, and proceed with playing the game? Well, let's think about this from uh, an expected value perspective. So what I want to do is I'm going to define a random variable x, uh, and it will be uh, the money that you win. Okay, so let's calculate the expected value. So that is your expected return from playing this game. Okay, uh, and without even writing down the definition, so you win $2 with uh, a one half probability. Uh, so that is you get a heads on the first one, I mean, that, and then a tails on the next one, uh, plus $4 times one fourth, plus $8 times one eighth, uh, and so on and so on. And uh, even I can do these simplifications so this is equal to one plus one plus one plus, and that will never stop. And that is infinite. You have an infinite expected value here. So the paradox here, oh, I guess I should say that this is actually a famous example. Uh, this is called the St. Petersburg. I think that's a U and not an E. Uh, Paradox. I forgot to write that in my notes. Um, so this is called the St. Peter's Paradox because one of the Bernoullis was in this Russian city when he came up with this idea. Um, there are many Bernoullis. It's a whole family of researchers and scientists. I always forget which one did which. But anyway, so what this says is, okay, so your expected return is infinite. So to play this game, you should be willing to pay any finite amount of money. Which, it's because I mean, uh, an infinite number minus, minus any finite number is infinite again, so you get infinite money. Um, so, no, uh, you definitely shouldn't do that for a few reasons. Um, one is that even though the expected value is infinite, you know, it's highly probable that the game just stops after, you know, two flips. So if you put down a million dollars to play this game, you're you're probably losing money. Um, another way to think of this is that this game is absurd and that no one could actually administer this game because there is not an infinite amount of money in the universe. There just isn't. There's a finite amount. So if you, if you go back and redo the calculation, realizing that any person administering this game only has a finite amount of money and you pick some arbitrary large finite value, the expected value very quickly shrinks to like $20 or something, even for like uh, a, a bankroll in the millions for the administrator. I forget the math in there, but you could work it out. It's not too hard. Um, but so when this happens, we say that the expectation is undefined. So pretty much everything else that we do, we're gonna be operating under the assumption that we're not in one of these cases where you have an undefined uh, expectation. Uh, I should also note that um, another sort of canonical example of this is uh, the Cauchy distribution. distribution. Uh, if there's ever like a rule or a theorem uh, in statistics, the distribution that inevitably breaks it is the Cauchy distribution. Uh, have a look. Um, one of the really oddities of the Cauchy distribution is that it does have a median, so it's symmetric about zero, but its mean is undefined. Uh, it's kind of a head scratcher. In the homework, you'll sort of investigate this a little bit, uh, but for now, I'll just leave that as a note for you to look into it. Okay, so now to something a little more practical, um, uh, that is if you're not a gambler, uh, and something that I sort of love because it's got something lazy part of it. So um, 
this is the slide that I could, once I finish this slide, I could just stop. Because really, once we have this definition, um, everything else that we're gonna see is basically just giving a name to specific values of R here. So what we're talking about here is something called the rule of the lazy statistician. So uh, we have some random variable X, and now I'm gonna define a new random variable, which is a function uh, of X, and, and I'm gonna call it Y. So to calculate the expected value of Y, um, one way to do that would be to get the distribution of Y and then just carry on with the um, usual expected value calculation. Or as the name suggests, you can be lazy and say, well, um, that is equivalent to the expected value of this function applied to X, um, which by definition is what we see written here. And then I'll just go ahead and write it out for both cases. Uh, so here we have R of X times F of X, uh, right? And that is in the discrete case. And in the not discrete case, other people would call that continuous. Um, we get something that looks like this. Okay, so um, with this, uh, it, it's, it's just, it can make your life easier. You only need to ever think about the distribution of X, but you can still calculate expectations uh, about Y. Um, a quick note here, I, I sort of wish personally, that this is just how we defined expectation. Uh, because if you think about it, if you let R be the identity, well, then this definition pops out the other side. And it's, this is really just a specific example of uh, this rule of the lazy statistician. Um, I, I consider myself one of these lazy statisticians. Uh, I always prefer to work smart than hard. Okay, let's do a quick example of that. So we have X defined to be some uniform random variable, in this case on the uh, interval between zero and two. Uh, we define Y to be uh, E to the X. That is our R of X in the definition. Uh, and just to note that uh, the PDF here is one over two for zero in the interval zero to two. Um, okay, so by definition, the expected value of y is integral from negative infinity to infinity of y f of y dy, where this is the PDF of y. But um, I don't know how you felt about this on the previous homework, but sometimes doing transformations of random variables is not too fun. So instead, I can be a lazy statistician. So what do I get? This is the same as the expected value of e to the x, which now applying the rule of the lazy, lazy statistician is something like the integral from zero to two of e to the x uh, times the PDF of x dx um, and uh, yeah some calculus happens I'll actually do it real quick uh, so something like u of the x evaluated at uh, x equals zero and x equals two so you get one half uh, e squared minus one cool all right so that was me being lazy I rather enjoyed it okay click definition so um, we define the kth moment of some random variable x to be the expected value of x to the kth power. Um, that is assuming it exists, uh, and here is a condition you can check to make sure that moment exists. Um, so if k is one here, um, that would be a way to check if the first moment exists, which we kind of implicitly already talked about. But now that we have the rule of lay statistician, I can talk about this absolute value function, and that makes sense. Um, excuse me. Um, I feel like there was something else I was going to say about this, but, uh, I don't think so. So moments will come up later. Um, for now they're just, um, they are particular expectations. So for example, if we looked at the expected value of X to the third, we would call that the third moment. Um, why would you want the third moment? I don't know, but maybe more on that later. Okay, uh, so now what we have here are uh, a couple theorems about random variables. 
So in the first one, we have x1 through xn, which are some random variables, and then a1 through an, which are constants. So then the expected value of the sum of the linear combinations of these things with the appropriate constants in front of the appropriate random variables, um, this works out to be the sum of the constants times the individual expectations. Okay, cool. Uh, there's a phraseology for this idea. This is called the linearity of expectation. All right, so um, sort of similarly, if we have x1 through xn, and those are all iid random variables, the expectation of the product becomes the product of the expectations. Um, one sort of big difference here, um, I realize that I don't actually need those to be iid, I just need them to be independent. I should double check that because I wrote it wrong, but I'm pretty sure I was wrong. Um, right. Uh, so importantly, uh, to get this product um, theorem, we need independence. To get linearity of expectation, we do not need independence. Okay. So um, here's an example. So suppose X is some random variable and we say that it follows a binomial random distribution with parameters n and p. And I want the expected value of this. So a side note here, when we have these named well-known distributions, you're welcome to just look up the means and variances in the book or on Wikipedia or wherever. But this one's a nice little example of illustrating why this, these two previous theorems, well, one of these previous theorems was useful. So we're gonna pretend for the moment, like we don't know what this expected value is. And what I have written here so far is, you know, just following the definition. Uh, but then I get to this last step and I kind of go, I don't want to deal with this sum. Um, I can do it if I really, really need to, but you have to go about this business of, you know, writing out that combination and then sort of canceling with that X and then rearranging some things. And then I think you need to apply the binomial theorem and then the answer sort of spits out. And I, I'm just not too good at math, so I don't want to do that. So um, I guess is again, a theme, I'm going to be lazy uh, or smart, depending on your point of view. So instead, I'm going to define X to be the sum of N random variables uh, x1 through xn, and each of those I'm going to say are iid, in this case, for newly random variables with success probability p. Um, I guess I'm, I'm sort of cheating a little bit and saying that these are equivalent, but I don't think that's too hard to understand because Bernoulli's are a bunch of yes-no trials, and what is binomial? Well, exactly the sum of a bunch of yes, no trials. Okay, so that's kind of by definition, but I'm being a little hand wavy there. Okay, so how about the expected value of each individual Bernoulli trial there? Well, that would be zero times the probability that it's zero plus one times the probability is one, which is P. Okay, cool. So then all I have to do is apply the theorem here about the linearity of expectation. So the expected value of X is the expected value of the sum of the XIs, which is the sum of the expected values uh, which each of these is just p and if we sum up that n times well we get n times p and i'm guessing that's no surprise but that is a nice way to apply the linearity of expectation to not have to um deal with this awful combination and sum and things that would have surely gone wrong okay great
So uh, next up is uh, the definition of variance. Uh, so the variance of a random variable x, which has mean, which we will notate with a mu, is defined as this expectation of x minus mu squared. So I want to pause here and say that like, that's it. That's the definition. So really all that's happening here is we're applying the rule of the lazy statistician um, and then with a particular function and then giving it a name that is the variance. Uh, to be specific though, if we break this down as I have been in terms of uh, discrete and continuous, uh, we get something like this in the discrete case and something like this in the continuous case. But again, I view this as the definition right here. Sigma squared is one of the ways we notate this. Uh, sometimes we'll just say sigma squared if we're being lazy and drop the x. Uh, sometimes we'll use this uh, chalkboard uh, v operator, sort of mirroring the e operator, you know, sort of whatever you prefer. Uh, sorry, something on my screen here. Oh no. Okay. Um, and then related to the variance is the standard deviation, uh, which is denoted with a sigma and is def defined to be the square root of the variance. Um, so that's kind of where the notation front comes from. So notationally, we can use a sigma. We can use a sigma of x if we're not being lazy, or sometimes we'll write the SD of x. So if the mean gives us sort of a clue into the center of the distribution, it's often said that the variance and standard deviation give us information about the spread. Uh, just a second. I wanna sort of pause here and say that both of those are sort of just shorthand for thinking about what they are. What the, the mean and the variance really are, are these definitions that we've written down. There's many other notions of center. There's many other notions of spread. These are just two, and that's sort of generically what we as humans sort of believe that they're doing. But what they're doing is written down. Uh, I don't know where to point, but uh, it's written down on this page right here. It's like, that's what it is. I mean, so um, don't, I, I don't want to say that the variance is the spread of the distribution. I want to say that the variance is what's written here. And often that can be thought of as the spread, but it is not the spread of the distribution. A minor point, but I think it's sort of important to consider. Okay, so a few properties of the variance. Um, so the first one says that the variance is the same as the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x squared. Um, this will be often an easier way to calculate a variance. Um, you're welcome to go through the definition, but often it's easier just to go directly to this um, alternative definition. Um, we also have this issue where uh, if you have the variance of ax plus b, that is a squared times the variance of b, pardon me. It's one more time, my notes were wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm right now. Um, uh, there is some intuition behind this, which is that if you multiply a constant times some value, assuming that constant's bigger than one, that will spread it out sort of further. Um, uh, I almost wanna check that. Uh, and then uh, if you add a constant, you're just shifting things around. So um, that doesn't matter in terms of this notion of spread. Okay. Uh, and then lastly, if we have x1 through xn independent, and then again, some constants, well, what do we get here? So we get the variance of the sum of those constants times the individual x values, let's say from i equals one to n. So this is the mirror of the, the linearity of expectation kind of definition. We get the sum of the ai's squared 
times uh, xi. So just to be clear, uh, there is a squared here, even though it wasn't written originally. Um, and I didn't close my brace there. Okay, cool. So, but uh, again, notice that here we require independence for this to be true. Unlike back with linearity of expectation, we just, we, we don't need the independence uh, condition there. Okay, cool. So um, going back to this idea of being lazy when calculating things about the uh, binomial distribution. So what I have written here in black is, well, if we just went through the definition of the variance, here it is. Um, I plugged in the, the known mean we already calculated, but even then, good luck with this. Uh, please don't ask me to calculate this. It's going to be pages of pages of me screwing up algebra on paper, crumpling it up and trying again. I don't want to do that. So again, we'll do this thing where we uh, instead define it as a sum of IID, so in, in particular independent uh, Bernoulli random variables. Um, I didn't even write that, but I think we can recall that. Uh, but importantly, I wrote that they were independent and that's the important thing. But again, they're Bernoullis. Um, so in this case, the expected value of xi squared for each one is 0 squared times the probability plus uh, 1 squared times its probability, which ends up just being p. So uh, a classic um, use of rule of lazy, stat lazy statistician because we're just squaring the random variable. So then the individual variances are the expected value of xi squared minus the expected value of xi squared, which is p minus p squared, which is p times 1 minus p. That's the way we normally see this. OK, and then lastly, to get the variance of x, we have, uh, let's see, the very, the variance of the sum of the xi's i equal one to n is the sum of the variance of the xi's i equal one to n uh, per uh, this last property here, and all the constants were just ones, um, so that becomes the sum i equal 1 to n of p times 1 minus p, which is n times p times 1 minus p, which I imagine you've seen before. Um, so we can say that when you have a binomial random variable with parameters n and p, the mean is np, which we calculated previously, the variance is n times p times 1 minus p, and again, this is not a calculation I would ask you to redo, but instead, if you know you were talking about normal or gamma or beta or exponential or Poisson, the means and variance of those have been calculated by people over and over again. They're well known. They're in the book. They're in every other probability book. They're on Wikipedia. Just look them up. No need to recalculate. Okay. All right. So uh, here's a theorem. Uh, that will sort of tie some of these things together. Um, so this is kind of like the really, really, really classic set setup in statistics. So we have n random variables, x1 through xn, uh, that are iid, and they all have the same mean, which we'll denote with mu, and they all have the same variance, which we will denote with sigma squared. So uh, three properties uh, that you should be aware of. One, the expected value of x bar n, which in a moment I will define, uh, is mu. So this is where x bar n is 1 over n times the sum of i equal 1 to n of xi. So this is often called the sample mean. It is a statistic, uh, but I'm not going to talk too much about that in particular because I just want to say that all of the x's that you see are here right now are still capital. That means they're all random variables. So we aren't, we aren't gathering any data and calculating these things on them. We're viewing them as random quantities of 
um, something that will potentially eventually have data gathered on it, but we're thinking of the pre-data collection step and the variability therein. Okay, so speaking of variability, uh, the variance of the sample mean under these conditions um, is sigma squared over n. Uh, and then lastly, this the expected value of this Sn squared quantity is sigma squared, where uh, Sn squared is defined to be 1 over n minus 1, sum i equal, that's not too great looking, oh, i equal 1 to n, xi minus x bar squared. Uh, you may know this as the sample variance. You might be asking, why n minus 1? Uh, long story short, because of the fact that when you use that minus 1, the expected value is exactly sigma squared. More on that much later when we talk about estimation. Um, but essentially, that gets us an unbiased estimator. Why do we need the n minus 1 to get the unbiased estimator? Well, uh, preview because instead of a mu here, we have an X bar here, so we lose a degree of freedom, but we haven't explained any of those things yet. Uh, but that's just a bit of preview of what we'll talk about when we get into statistical inference. Okay. Still going strong. All right. So, so far we've mostly been talking about, um, a single random variable that might be defined as a bunch of other random variable as a function of other random variables. So now we talk about the relationship between random variables. So let's say we have a random variable X with mean mu X and variance sigma squared X, a random variable Y with mean mu Y and variance sigma squared Y. I now define the covariance of X and Y to be something like this. Okay, and again, uh, from there, it's just rule of lazy statistician. We have a function of two random variables, so it would be an integral over that function times the joint PDF of those things. Good luck, have fun integrating. Okay, cool. Um, so covariance sort of, uh, as the name suggests, tells you how those variables vary um, together. So do they vary together or not? Uh, and one way we sort of look at this instead of the covariance we often uh, do a manipulation of this to talk about the correlation of these two variables, um, which is defined to be the covariance of X comma Y divided by uh, sigma squared X, sigma squared Y, square root of that. Um, so I, I, I pause again to say that we're not dealing with data. So, I'm sure, you know, if you're taking this class, you've, you know, had had data with two variables and calculated a correlation coefficient between them. Um, that's not this. That is an estimate of this, and we're not there yet. This tells me how the two distributions co-vary, not how two realizations of data vary. Uh, it's a subtle point, but I find for some reason with correlation, that trips people up more than like mean and sample mean. Um, this one really, um, I think, people make that mistake a little bit more. So this is, we're purely talking about two distributions of two different random variables and how they co-vary. Okay, uh, a few sort of properties of this. So uh, the covariance breaks down to be these two expectations here. So the expectation of X, Y minus the expectation of X times the expectation of Y. Um, we can also show that the correlation uh, must be bounded between negative one and one. That's probably no surprise. Um, but then there's one more thing, which this first one sort of hints at. So if X comma Y are independent, then the covariance of X comma Y must be zero. Um, and then so must the uh, correlation. Um, and that happens because when things are independent, this expected value of x, y is exactly the expected value of x times the expected value of y, and this thing washes and you get zero. 
But uh, strong note here, um, the reverse is not true. At least in general. There could be specific cases where it is, but also there could be specific cases where it is not. So uh, I leave as an exercise to you to either come up with one of these examples by yourself. So write down a random variable X and give it a distribution, do the same for Y, and they get them to be independent. Sorry, oh, sorry, uh, correlated, but independent. Uh, or, or you can surely find one. Um, sorry, sorry. Oh, I, I, didn't, I, I misspoke there. They're not correlated. They're uncorrelated, but dependent. That's what you can find. Okay, sorry. Uh, I hope I said that right just now, but if not, uh, it'll be in the book and it'll set it right there. I may have mixed myself up because there's too many negations and flips there. Okay, I'm also bad with mirrors. All right, so, uh, right. So um, now let's talk about, um, let, let's return to this notion of variances of sums of random variables. So notice that now, we are uh, not assuming independence. So this definition we had sort of seen before, but a larger version of it. But so now we see that we have to add this term for the covariance. And if we move to the even more general case, um, we get this big sort of nasty expression here. Um, which, which might be a little bit uh, difficult to wrap your head around. So uh, if we advance one slide, um, I'm gonna, instead of um, uh, n random variables, I'm gonna define a, a vector of random variables. Uh, for some reason I switched from n to k, but bear with me. Um, so this vector of random variables has a mean vector, uh, mu one through mu k. Um, and then so we define the uh, variance covariance matrix, sometimes just called a covariance matrix, which is the variance of this random vector. Uh, and, and hopefully uh, with the elements that I've written out here, you can start to see a pattern. So along the diagonal here are the variances of the individual elements of the random vector. And then on the off diagonals, so for example here, this is the covariance between x1 and x2, which I would note is the same as the covariance of x2, x1, and so on and so forth. So that means that this upper triangle is just a mirror image of the lower triangle. Um, and so what this big sort of huge expression here is really saying is add up all the elements of this variance covariance matrix if you throw all the x1 through xn into a random vector. Um, so that two is coming from the fact that these two triangles uh, ha have all the same uh, entries in them. Um, and there's also the constants that I've added here, but you would just sort of put them in front of the relevant elements here. But uh, yeah, so that's a general idea. We won't necessarily leverage this idea too much, but um, definitely a definition you should know about. Okay, so now let's talk about conditional expectations. So this is the definition. Um, so the expectation of X, given that Y takes some particular value, um, we see the two definitions here. So basically you just need to use the conditional distribution of X given Y instead of the distribution of X. So this can be a little, oh, sorry, uh, one definition and then a, some explanation, or sorry, a theorem. So this is what's called the rule of iterated expectation. So here we have uh, on the first line, the expected value of the expected value of y given x, and that works out to be the expected value of y, and then sort of similar, similarly, when we flip the conditional, we end up with the expected value of x. This is also called Adam's law. So perhaps some, some sort of uh, cryptic 
uh, definitions and theorems here. So let's do an example to highlight some things. Okay. So in this example, we have a random variable X and we say it's gonna be uniform on the interval zero to one. I drew a pretty little picture of this on the left. We're also gonna define Y conditioned on X taking some particular value to be uniform between that value of X and that value of Y. Sort of meaning that if we take a random sample uh, between zero and one and it, we get an X value here, well, then y is uniform over these values here. Okay, so I've now written the expected value of y given x equals x and the expected value of y given x. Okay, so first of all, the expected value of y given x equals x, I'm going to say that is x plus 1 over 2. And I'm not going to derive this. I'm just going to argue that I'm, that I'm correct, meaning... Um, if, if we sample from X and we get this, and we say that between that value and one, we have a new uniform distribution for Y, well, then the, the mean is just the midpoint between those two things, which is X plus one over two. Um, right, okay. So I wanna note that this, th this, the X here is a little X. So this is a function of x, which is some placeholder for a number. So this is a function that returns a number. But now if I drop the x equals x and I have the expected value of y given x, well, then that is big X plus one over two, meaning that this is a random variable. That's a really subtle point, but sort of important when talking about these sorts of things. Especially if you're gonna take two expectations in a row, because if you weren't using the random variable version, you would end up with a number and the expected value of a number is just that number and that wouldn't work too well. So now to calculate the expected value of Y, we can do the expected value of Y given x, the expected value of that. So that is, we're applying the rule of iterated expectation. Um, right, so this is the expected value of x plus one over two. That is subbing in uh, what we calculated previously, but as a random variable. Uh, and then from the expectation rules that we've been talking about, uh, we get something like this. And I don't think anyone would fight me if, they, if I said that the expected value of X was one half. So we get 0 0.5 plus one uh, divided by two. Um, and oh gosh, did I write this in my notes? Yeah, I did. Okay, so I'm not good at arithmetic, but my notes say that that is 0 0.75. Okay, cool. So that's a little insight into um, how these two uh, definitions can be used. Let's see. Um, so sort of similarly, we have this notion of conditional variance. Um, and, uh, we also have, uh, a theorem related to that, which is called the, either the variance decomposition or the Eves law. That is, this is Eves law to Adam's law. So they kind of go together, which sort of, uh, breaks down, um, the variance of y into uh, variances and expectations of conditional variances and conditional expectations. Okay, um, I'm not going to go through an example of this because it would probably be a lot of tedious calculation, but um, similar to this example here, which is from the Wasserman book, um, there's also a nice uh, example of um, applying this to a model that's defined hierarchically to get um, uh, uh, an unconditioned variance. Okay. So um, hopefully you're hanging in there. So am I, uh, we're almost done. Alrighty, did I, okay. So another uh, definition. So um, hopefully you're noticing a pattern here that all these definitions are just, well, we're picking a particular function, applying the rule of the lazy statistician and giving it a name. So here we define the moment generating function of X. 
often called the MGF. Um, we use this, I think that's a phi. So we say phi of x of t is equal to uh, the expected value of uh, e to the tx. Uh, and then I, I sort of just use that definition that says, well, you, you could push this forward into um, uh, the continuous and discrete definitions if you want. But again, we're just applying the um, rule of uh, the lazy, lazy statistician. So um, why is this definition uh, useful? Um, well, um, it turns out that if we take the derivative of this moment varying function and plug in the value zero for t, um, so I, I sort of worked this out here and I, I'm sort of uh, using but not talking about why we can do it. We can sort of swap expectation and differentiation. It, it works, we're allowed to do that. Um, this works out to be the expected value of x. That's kind of neat. Uh, but actually, in general, if we take the moment generating function and take k derivatives of it and plug in 0 for t, well, that becomes the expected value of x to the k, which otherwise known as the kth moment. So what does the moment generating function do? It generates moments. Very clever, I know. Um, I should also note that along the way in this lecture, I've been writing down a ton of definitions and a ton of theorems. Um, some of these, uh, well, at least one or two of them are going to appear on homework as an exercise for you. Um, but many of them, the proof can be found in the book. Uh, but we're a little more interested in using these things as a way of improving these things. So um, I, I do suggest you read the book, by the way. Um, but um, I'm not doing all the proofs here. But you know, some of them I expect you to be able to do. Uh, for others, feel free to reference the textbook. Um, but that's just a minor note. Okay, so some properties of the moment generating function real quick. In particular, if we, if we defined y to be this linear function of x, uh, we see how we can get one moment generating function from another. Um, possibly uh, more interesting is that if we have x1 through xn that are independent, and then we define a new random variable, which is the sum of these things, we can get the moment generating function for that new random variable y um, by taking the product of the uh, moment generating functions for uh, the individual xi's. Okay, cool. So you may be thinking to yourself, why? Like, I mean, it's great that it generates moments and all, but like, why do we care about moments? Uh, this is my reminder to tell my one statistics joke. I mean, it's not the only one, but it's the only good one. So uh, we say that statisticians, we may be dull, but we have our moments. I would normally hold for laughter here. No, I wouldn't. Everyone always just stares back when I tell that joke. Anyway, I guess I, I should I should look. Mm. Yeah, good joke, Dave. Okay, so the reason we care about moments, um, or moment generating functions, that is, uh, is because they're useful for showing something. So let's say we have two random variables x and y, and I show that they have the same moment generating function um, for all t in some open interval around zero. Well, if that's the case, then we say that x has the same distribution function as y. That's what this notation here means. So that's great. So the, 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 the usefulness of moment generating functions is that we can show often that two different random variables have the same distribution. Um, certainly there are other ways of doing that, but oftentimes you'll find that using a moment generating function uh, can be um, a nice and easy way of doing that. Okay, that's it. Uh, we made it to the end, we did it. Um, that was kind of a long video. Uh, hopefully, uh, when I upload this, I'll go back and put some chapters in so we can sort of return to certain things. Um, I, I'm sort of curious how y'all feel about one long video for a week slash chapter of the book versus smaller ones. I personally like to be able to like go back and reference a little bit without having to like rewrite them and reintroduce them to not waste time. 
And since we're not doing this live, I sort of feel like, well, you can pause, you can seek and go back, but I, I'm, I'm open to uh, suggestions around that. This one clocked in around, uh, I just passed the hour mark. Uh, my, th my throat is really starting to not like me anymore. So this is about as long as it can ever be. But um, uh, I'm curious how you feel about these maybe versus videos in your other classes that are shorter. Um, for this length of video, my usual sign off is very appropriate, which is if you made it to the end, good job. And I will see you in the next video.